So we're going to keep talking innovation. Uh, our next panel is going to be talking about innovations to address water supply, everything from aquifer storage and recovery uh, to water reuse and produced water. Um, while they're making their way up, I do want to thank the Upper Trinity GCD and Panhandle GCD for co-sponsoring breakfast. I would also encourage you during our upcoming break, which is not now, but it's soon, to finish up playing Exhibitor Bingo. It'll be your last chance to get entered to win those uh, uh, prizes. Uh, thanks to the North Plains GCD for sponsoring the app. I'd like to introduce Neil Deeds from Intera. He is our trusty, uh, tried and true moderator. I'm going to let him introduce his panelists. Let's give them a warm welcome. Is that already on? Yes. Should we do mic check? Yeah, maybe mic check real quick, Steve. Check. Check. All right, Scott. We're good. Excellent, excellent. Well, welcome and thanks to everyone. It's actually a fairly full room. I always wonder on Thursdays whether I'm going to have a full room, but I really appreciate everybody sticking around for this. Um, the topic of this panel is called All of the Above, an ASR, MAR, and Reuse Future. And the objective here is really for us to discuss the present and the future of what we're gonna call innovative water supply strategies. Sometimes people hear innovated and they just put in the word expensive water supply strategies. But a lot of the cheap water is gone. In fact, most of the cheap water is gone. So these are the types of strategies that I think are gonna be critical uh, for the future of water in Texas and, and even beyond Texas. So the types of technologies we're gonna talk about is indirect potable reuse, aquifer storage recovery, and managed aquifer recharge. And, and finally, we're going to talk about produced water. And there's a ton of expertise on this panel. All of these panelists could talk about all those topics probably for 45 minutes by themselves. So we have to be careful kind of to try to keep this inside the time limits. Um, I'm going to count on you guys to try to keep it inside the time limits. But I'm, I just, I'm very proud to have these people up here. There's, there's at least 150 years of experience up here. And that's, that's David alone. So I mean, with... <laughs> I have to pick on David a little bit. He's a, he's a good sport. So just a quick introduction. Um, David Smith, he's a discipline lead at CDM and has a global experience. You can tell global by his Oklahoma accent in innovative water supply projects. Um, his focus is going to be on alternative source waters for ASR. David. And then we have Christy Shaw. You're a senior professional associate at HDR. Is that right? And your focus is going to be mostly on resiliency and well, your focus in your career is on resiliency. You're going to talk about indirect potable reuse opportunities for managed aquifer recharge in Texas. And we're going to define terms, first thing. You got that to look forward to. And then we have Scott Reinert. And he is the water resources manager at El Paso Water Utility. Many of you know him. And finally, um, Steve Walden, who's basically had a couple of uh, chapters in his career, a couple of 20 years chapters, I guess, first on the regulatory side, Steve, and then uh, more than 20 years as an independent consultant. And I know him from Texas DSAL and TAWWA, but he's also very active in the Texas Produced Water Consortium. And so Steve's going to be talking about produced water today, which is another potential alternative water source. So to open it up, I always like to do a little fun fact that's kind of unrelated to folks' personal lives. And this one turned out to have a musical motif. So Steve apparently um, does blues harmonica. So he jams, does blues jam sessions in Austin and wherever you travel. And when he, he revealed that, then the rest, of, uh, the rest of the panel here, it turns out that Christy plays the trombone. Yes. <laughs> Scott plays French horn. And then David, what is your instrument of the past? Well, I play guitar now, but I used <laughs> to play oboe. The oboe. And so, you know, I'm just filled with terror thinking about combining all those instruments together. And, and the other thing that kind of struck me was, you know, blues harmonica is fairly cool. And the other instruments, I don't know if you would call them cool. And so you might be able to guess which ones are the engineers up here. There's three engineers and one non-engineer. And so I think you can tell by the musical instruments they chose <laughs> along with their careers. So, all right. Yeah. That's enough of that. Um, let's launch into it. So the way we're going to structure it, we're going to do background. 
We're going to talk about technical challenges. We're going to talk about regulatory challenges. And then we're going to finish up with, with closing remarks. So we're going to jump right in and start talking about sort of the background to it. And we're going to start, I think, with Christy. And Christy, you were going to do a little bit of introduction on the acronyms, MAR, IPR, ACR, ASR, et cetera. I am, and as an engineer, I love my acronyms. Um, but I wanted to make sure that everybody was on the same page with respect to the conversation that we're going to have. Um, for managed aquifer recharge, also known as MAR, um, that essentially is the umbrella of um, artificial recharge projects. And so that underneath it is... Um, is ASR, or Aquifer Storage and Recovery. And really, when it boils down to it, it's the intention upon which you're planning to use that water. So for MAR, it's, it's artificial recharge with the intention of beneficial use. Um, sometimes that's going to be to just replenish the aquifer and to be able to prevent seawater intrusion or subsidence. Um, or an, a need to condition the aquifer and do some some type of treatment. Um, however, with ASR, the intention behind that is to bank it for a later use and be able to pull that water out. So it's storing it with the intention of beneficial use in the future and being able to retrieve that water. Um, IPR is indirect potable reuse, and uh, that is the um, the reclaim using reclaimed water. Um, for beneficial use and, and being able to put it in, or discharge it into a surface water or groundwater system. Um, it provides some, um, some further water treatment as part of that process. Um, and with ASR, coupled with ASR, it's, it, it'll be to retrieve that water at a later time um, for water supply purposes or other beneficial use. Thanks, Christy. And I let Christy go first because she and I agree on those definitions. And I think there's some not complete agreement on how you describe, you know, MAR versus SAR or ASR, et cetera. So I'm going to let David go next. And David, just talk kind of specifically about ASR with respect to using wells for that purpose. Yeah, so ASR in my world is, is a subset of managed aquifer recharge. MAR is everything from surface infiltration to deep injection wells. ASR, when we first started implementing those systems more than 30 years ago, our focus was to use aquifers to store water, not necessarily to beneficially recharge an aquifer, but simply the aquifer allows us to store another source of water in an aquifer so that we can beneficially take that out at a later time, whether it means meeting a peak week demand when we don't have enough supply or for drought mitigation, we want to bank that water so when a drought comes along, we can do that. Another quick benefit of the ASR system that we quickly learned is one of the problems of recharging water into wells is sometimes they plug. Well, with an ASR system, we have the pump in the well. So we'll recharge through different means into a well, but when we recover that water, we use that pump to recover. But that pump also allows us to flush the well and remove any sediment or accumulation from plugging. So that's an added benefit. And, and I think that's a great point that you'll probably elaborate a little on in the next section. Um, I did want to move on to, to Steve and, and talk about produced water. That's the one that I know the least about, and I really think I hope that this panel, we can talk a little bit and remove some of the uncertainty, some of the questions about produced water and what the opportunities are, Steve. Yeah, produced water reflects all of the water that comes up related to the oil and gas production process. And, you know, it's, it's kind of uh, difficult to even imagine that I would ever be involved in this kind of a project because I come from a regulatory background overseeing the drinking water program at TCQ. And that it's a, the reason that I'm involved at all is that I got interested when I found out about five years ago, I, I heard about the volumes and that, so there's incredible volumes. And, and so it, it, we'll get into it later, but it is, there, that's what it is. And, and there's huge volumes in Texas and particularly, particularly in the Western Permian Basin, the Delaware Basin that are, are net available water that we have been throwing away and putting it in deep injection. And we can't probably continue to do that without at least doing an objective evaluation. Thus, the Texas Produced Water Consortium was involved now to try to put some science and policy in place and look at it, it's how feasible it is. And we'll get into that detail. That's great. I really appreciate that, Steve. And then, Scott, you're going to round out our background section um, really to talk about how some of the strategies that have been discussed here are actually being used in El Paso water utility. 
Yes, yeah, so thank you. Um, El Paso, um, I'll use the acronyms. Um, I'll mention that I used to call our program in El Paso ASR, and David here did correct me, and I, actually, I do agree with him. Uh, what El Paso does is we use infiltration basins to let this uh, highly treated wastewater effluent that meets potable standards infiltrate into the aquifer, uh, and then it's recovered with other wells down gradient. And so by this uh, definition you heard Christy give, uh, we are doing managed aquifer recharge. We're not actually using wells to inject and retrieve. You know, that's what other uh, communities do, like San Antonio. That's, they do that. We, we get the water down there, and then other wells uh, utilize it later. All right, great. <clears throat> and that, I think that hopefully kind of sets the stage for everybody. I know not everybody knows, again, what all these acronyms mean. We'll, we'll keep trying to spell it out and explain it as we go along. But we are going to move then into talking about technical and economic challenges of these various strategies, and especially in their implementation. And so, I don't know, Steve, if you could just start us out by talking about, just in terms of technical and economics, some of the challenges with produced water or opportunities. So I think the, the, the place to start with is uh, we are, we've heard repeatedly about the shortages of, grunt of all water sources in Texas. And so in, in this particular case, uh, just the Western Permian alone, volume-wise, the water volumes we're talking about is kind of a net available is probably uh, 500,000 acre feet per year. That's not a little bit of water. That's probably an undercount because that's really not uh, accounting all the water coming in from New Mexico and there's other waters. So it could be a million acre feet of a year. And even if you beneficially reused all that water in the oil patch, they could only use a little, a little bit of that. So we're talking significant like water that is not in our portfolio in Texas. That's what got my attention. And uh, so the, the question then is, is it technically feasible? And, and that's what we're looking at. And the answer is, you know, at, at scale, in uh, the Marcellus Shale in Pennsylvania, that's when I became a believer that we could prob possibly do this, is I learned you know, that there has been a project, project up there with a group called Eureka Resources. It's been permitted by the state and the EPA. They've got a TPDS permit. They discharge pretty close to distilled water quality as a, it were for no cost at all to the Susquehanna River. And they, they harvest a bunch of minerals and, they, and they, they make the economics work by a tipping fee on the front end from the, the producers who cannot inject that up there. And then they they get uh, they sell various salts and minerals in dish and they've re recently started the process they're going to start recovering lithium which comes up from the deep earth, so uh, those offset these costs and uh, you get into either uh, uh, evaporative processes or certain uh, very uh, specialized membrane processes and you can e extract the water out and basically leave residuals behind whether you whether you harvest them for other purposes or not that's what makes the economics work. So it's actually possible, and we've got regulatory hurdles that are not that bad to get to. I mean, we can get there, and we'll get into some more detail about the technical issues, but you have issues with organics, you've got metals, you've got high salts, and you have naturally occurring radioactive materials, NORM, and uh, how do you balance all those things out? And it, it is being done. We, we can go to a site, and you can physically go see at the site. We can go there. It's not like it's not a science exp fair experiment. It is a real deal that happens. So the question is, can we take something similar to that or, or newer versions of that and, and make it happen in Texas in an economic way? And, and the answer was initially no, but now we can for one reason. There's been seismic activity enough in the Permian to get the, apparently, this is just my take on it, the, the, the major boards of these major oil companies are going, wow, we have liability attached to this and maybe we can't afford to do some beneficial reuse. So all of a sudden we have six pilots getting ready to happen through the Texas Produce Water Consortium process where there will be third party testing. It's not going to happen tomorrow, but over the next two years there will be some some small scale where they're putting out and they're going to be injecting this, the products into aquifers back to the injection well, so it's not like it's going to be permitted from that standpoint, but we'll be able to do third-party monitoring. So it's very exciting to be part of something where we're going to get some objective science put through the consortium at Texas Tech University to determine is this safe or not safe, and we'll get into other details later. Yeah, that sounds great. I mean, it sounds like with the oil companies seeing some risk, it makes an opportunity to maybe bring the science together or, or find the funding to help advance that science. David, could you talk a little bit about, I mean, you've been doing ASR your whole life, but 
alternative source waters is kind of a different thing. I mean, injecting water, for instance, that's not actually been treated to potable or it's, it's a reuse type water. Talk a little bit about the technical or economic challenges with that. Yeah, so let me quickly set the scene because I think a lot of people don't understand the real opportunity that ASR provides because I agree with Vanessa's comments earlier about sustainable use of groundwater. But groundwater in the same breath, there's a lot of water in storage in those systems. And I mean, for example, we're evaluating some very deep systems in the Hoston, 3,000 feet deep, but the aqua is four to 500 feet thick. And if you think about the effect of porosity of say 20%, that's equivalent to a reservoir underground 100 feet deep. So I'm able to store 50, 60, 100,000 plus acre feet in a small system, which is what we need to do. Now the challenge is, where do you get that water from? So traditionally we've used treated water, and so when we've got surplus flows on treatment plants, that's what we've done. But what we're now having to start looking at is alternative sources of water. And some of the really obvious ones are flood pool water from our reservoirs. We're in discussion with the Corps of Engineers to see if we can scalp that water. Um, storm water, there's challenges there though in terms of the turbidity and the plugging that storm water, so we had to do some um, pretreatment to get that in the ground. And then the other obvious one is reuse in terms of wastewater. And of course the question there is what level of treatment do we need to do to get that water in the ground to be compliant? Um, and what do we need to consider in terms of things like biogrowth with nutrients and those sorts of things. But the bottom line is we're going to have to get really creative at using water sources other than pure treated drinking water, but we desperately need to get those sorts of sources into the ground. And do you feel like there's any of those sources that require a particular, I mean, is the technology there to do at least the removal of suspended solids, the kinds of things that would cause clogging in the wells. Yeah, so absolutely. I mean, I'm working on a project in Hawaii where we're taking stormwater from the top of the island that was an abandoned source for Honolulu, and we're reappropriating that source of water, doing treatment in terms of turbidity removal, moving that partway down the island, generating hydroelectric power from that drop in elevation, and then recharging that water into an aquifer to that, That's a great example. So, so we got the technology. It's all coming down to cost. But as the cost of cheap water goes away, this is, this is the direction we need to go. That, that makes total sense. Um, Scott, I don't know, you know if you can just kind of briefly talk about, because you on this panel have the longest you know, le uh, experience with a working system, with a successful system, and if you could talk a little bit about some of the technical challenges maybe you've encountered along the way or that you see in the future use of the systems. Yeah, so. The El Paso uh, project that we were talking about is kind of interesting in that it's a wastewater plant that's 20 miles away from a river. Typically, wastewater effluent is discharged into a river, um, and we were overflowing our lagoons into Fort Bliss, and Fort Bliss told us to get our shit out of there. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to build a wastewater plant 20 miles away from the river, which at, in 1980s was kind of, uh, how do you do that? So you treat your wastewater to meet drinking water standards. And then we began injection wells. Um, and our sediments are very fine grained. And one of the challenges that we had is continual plugging. And the only people that really liked our injection wells back in the day was a pump contractor because he got paid monthly to put in a brand new pump because <laughs> we kept clogging up. And it's very fine grained sediments. David and I have had this discussion. But what works best for El Paso is our basins. We strip off the superficial caliche, which is like cement. You strip that off, you let the water migrate, it moves down to the water table, it's very efficient, and uh, much, uh, it's very cost effective too. And an injection well, if you drill and equip it, is uh, 500,000 to a million dollars with a pump, uh, 800 foot well, and a basin, uh, when you own the land is about $80,000 to excavate a basin. And uh, so it's very cost effective for us, but you have to have the, the, the geology that works. That makes a lot of sense. And that's a, just a perfect segue to a question for, for Christy. If you could comment, I know Christy, you were the project manager for the statewide study. It looked both at MAR and ASR and you know, where in the state it may be possible or feasible and where it may not. Can you comment a little about MAR, the type of infiltration basin style, 
recharge that that Scott is doing there at El Paso and the potential across the state. Sure. Um, I've worked on um, MAR and ASR projects in six states. And um, the work that, that we did on the statewide ASR survey um, and, and aquifer recharge really kind of amplified, I guess, the, the geology conditions. And I think that it's really critical. Um, the, the hydrogeology is favorable. Um, Scott's in a really great area where the Waco Bolsons, um, it makes sense to have infiltration basins. Um, I think that the Brazos um, Valley Alluvium presents another opportunity. Um, that's kind of what the results of the, the Water Development Board survey showed. Um, one of the biggest challenges is having enough land for infiltration basins. Um, those are very sizable, whereas with ASR, you can get the water underground and then you've got your your underground uh, storage area. But as far as the surface is concerned, it's very small footprint. Another thing I think is, is looking at very closely at the geochemical compatibility, whether it be the infiltration basins on the surface, and Scott talked a little bit about the maintenance of that and how that's so much better um, for El Paso. Um, you know, really having a good understanding of the geochemical compatibility and what happens when you send that new source water down into an, a natural um, aquifer and, and how that blends with the native groundwater is really critical. I think that presents one of the technical challenges too with, with um, indirect potable reuse too is maintaining that consistent water quality. Um, because you don't want to have mechanical clogging, you don't want to have issues um, with pathogens that get out of control, understanding your pH and ionic strength, and making sure that those aren't too terribly different um, between the two waters, uh, I think is really important. And then, you know, disinfection. I think that's going to be an important topic still continuing forward. You don't want to have any pathogen growth, but at the same time, you don't want to create disinfection byproducts. Um, all of this is, is stuff that, you know, there's the science there, but I think the piloting and the monitoring and the understanding really about your source water um, and, and making sure that you can anticipate those conditions is going to be really critical to the success from a technical perspective. Yeah, that's that's an excellent point. And when we were discussing this prior to the to the panel, you know, all of you had mentioned the emergency emerging contaminant issue. So PFOS and whether in an aquifer that doesn't have PFOS, you want to be putting what is at, what's potable water by, you know, by the regs, but also we know has emergency can, emerging contaminants in it. Christy, I want you to touch on that a little bit in the next section, and then I'm sure all of you have an opinion if we have time to talk about that. But we're going to go ahead and move on and talk a little bit more about the regulatory, I'll, I'll say, and political challenges, but mostly regulatory challenges. And, and Dave, I was hoping you could kind of start out and talk about, you know, ASR, again, injecting, let's say it's non-potable, let's say it's reused water. You know, is there any pushback from a regulatory perspective? Is the regulatory framework in place for us to even do that? Yeah, so let's say we're an uncharted territory here. I mean, in other states, they have a very strict interpretation of compliance on the water quality that's allowable to put down an injection well. When you are recharging into a USDW, in other words, an aquifer with a salinity of less than 10,000 TDS. In Florida, we did a number of sites where we implemented ASR going below the USDW. In other words, you're getting into really saline f um, formations. And when I say saline, was I'm talking numbers like 10 to 20,000 TDS. The problem is we start encountering mixing issues, buoyancy issues because of the density. And so it's not that we couldn't do it, but it was problematic. But that stopped us from strategically storing these other sources of water because of the cost of treating the water to drinking water standards. What I want to tease the community on is House Bill 655, when it was, um, issued, I think, six years ago, the intent of that was to use ASR for storing not just treated water, but other sources of water. And their language was something to the effect of ensuring no public endangerment. So what does that mean? I mean, one interpretation is when you store water in an ASR system, and I'm not talking about recharge per se, I'm not talking where the water spreads a long way. In the case of some sites that we're doing in Williamson County, we're projecting 60,000 acre feet is going to move 2,000 feet from the wells, and that is it. 
and it's not moving. We've done modeling on systems that demonstrate that over 70 years, we're going to see the water move a few hundred feet. So if you've got control, either through ordinances, property ownership, or some other way that says nobody else can drill into that particular storage zone, why can we not put water that is still good water, don't get me wrong, but not necessarily 100% compliant with drinking water standards. So we're going to test that. And I'm pretty sure that the UIC folks are going to say, yes, but you have to prove there's no public endangerment. And so that's why we're in a, in a, in a new area of saying, all right, we're probably going to have to put monitor wells in on the boundaries of those properties and technically with the scientific data demonstrate that, yes, there is no deterioration in an aquifer beyond our own storage zone. And then the final thing you'll ask, well, what if you put some disinfection and you're gonna cause disinfection byproducts? And incidentally, we've researched this in the past many times, but the bottom line is the public endangerment is again, again going to be when we recover that water, what water treatment do you need to make sure that when that water comes back out the ground, it's safe for whatever purpose it's set for and does meet those drinking water standards. Yeah, so no. I say watch this space because one of the detriments is if we're not careful, we're gonna spend a huge amount of money and decide not to do this because of that and not see the overall big benefit of storing that strategic water and not over pumping our aquifers. That, that, that makes sense. And the, and the challenge of, you know, if you go to the client and say, well, you gotta treat it before it goes in, then you gotta treat it when it comes back out can be kind of a deal breaker, at least initially. Um, Steve, can you comment on produced water? Kind of a, a similar question in the sense that I think a lot of people think, well, produced water, you know, it's got all these, these things in it that you need to clean up. So from a regulatory perspective, do you think there's some momentum from the legislature and others to really move this, this ball forward? Yeah, the, I, th I mean, the fact that we have the Texas Produced Water Consortium in existence from Senate Bill 601 and that it has received uh, this last session $5 million to do this oversight of uh, pilots and things like that means that they're serious. Right. They're, I mean, I, the, 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 if the volumes have gotten their attention. And the fact that we have the water constraints in Texas that we do, the question about uh, regulatory issues presently – there's not probably, uh, amazingly, we actually have a pretty green light to be able to discharge TPDS west of I-35, basically. That, 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 uh, and so you get west of that meridian and you can, you could do that for, you know, for ecological purposes and things like that in agriculture. And, and so the water could go, for example, into Red Bluff Res Reservoir was probably one of the local, the most likely destination for this kind of water. The, the question you get into is that this small parameter of like these industrial permits at the EPA level ha ha actually has, what we will be expecting to happen is that the industry will voluntarily provide a huge level of additional monitoring beyond what the minimums are. And because it has to do with, there's, there's both known and unknown constituents in produce water. And so, you, you, but what will happen in treatment will be robust in that it will have redundancies and such that you will take out classes of constituents. So that means all, even the known and the unknown in those various classes that all, all of them are gonna be existing in metals and semi-volatiles and volatiles, et cetera, they're gonna all be there. So whether they're known or unknown, they're gonna get taken out. But the, the thing that we need to do with it, and that I'm very excited about is that we're gonna be looking at a variety of toxicity testing tools that, and technologies beyond what like the whole effluent toxicity test that is done well beyond that, so that we can look at this synergy of these contaminants, the known and the unknowns, because that's really what we, we're, we are living organisms. So it doesn't matter that you could be in compliance with a bunch of MCLs, you still could have synergies of things, even compliant drinking water today. So I think so, so I think that's what we're, we're hoping the toxicity brings us together. And I think that's one of the exciting breakthroughs that will help in the rest of the water field. It will help in ASR too. Absolutely. And you you had said earlier, you were there the concern, maybe not a concern, but something that needs to be solved is the unknown unknowns in terms of those mixing and water quality. So yeah, that's I think that applies <coughs> for many of these technologies. Um, Christy, I think that I kind of asked you to delay talking about emerging, emerging contaminants as a potential thing when you're doing MAR, or those types of things. You want to just comment on, is there, do we even know, you know, what the future brings in terms of regulatory? That is a whole nother conversation, um, for sure. But I can just touch on it in that it's going to be something that we have to think about. We have to consider it. And as the science is developing, I don't think that we need to 
we need to slow down in, in the testing and piloting and really proving up ASR and MAR. Um, but I do feel like we need to be very cognizant of that because you don't want to create a situation. And there have been places um, in the United States where, you know, there's been um, a lack of testing of, of certain chemicals. And then you find out that you're creating a, a problem, um, you know, by, by having an ASR system. Um, and certainly those are, are unfortunate lessons learned, but something that is, is important to just be mindful of moving forward. I, I think that from the indirect potable reuse perspective, it's maintaining that water quality, having a good understanding, having a, a, having a knowledge about you know, what that's gonna look like in the long term. And I agree with all the panelists about you know, the monitoring aspect of it. Um, I think TCEQ is, is, has been very reasonable um, in their asks and in the application process. And, and since they provide the, the mechanism for getting permits for, for ASR um, projects in, in Texas, um, they've continued to develop tools um, to, to help understand like the recoverability of ASR systems, as well as some of the water quality issues um, folks are very concerned, rightfully so, with mobilization of metals and arsenic and so forth. Um, and there's some guidance that, that they have provided uh, for operators that, that's pretty important. Um, I will say that to, uh, you know, TCQ regulates um, ASR throughout the state, but the condition is that the Edwards is a little bit tricky. Um, and that is another conversation too. There's, there's um, legislation that, uh, that really makes it challenging to, to go through the Edwards um, to, or to be able to store um, in the Edwards if, if you're in Kinney County and then all the way up to Williamson County. And, and there was a bill that was introduced um, this last session to kind of relieve um, some of that for Williamson County east of I-35. Um, and, and Dave knows quite a bit about that and could talk more Well, I was afterwards. the primary person behind that bill and I thought, how am I going to make this bill go through quickly? So I thought, I won't do my geology brain. I'll say everything east of I-35 will do ASR. But, there you go. And, and incidentally, it was vetoed. Yesterday it was mentioned that that bill passed. No, it got, it got unanimously voted by the House and the Senate, but the governor, through his wisdom, vetoed that. Um, but I'm told that it's going to be in a special session in October, so fingers crossed. And, and I think we're going to have to jump across to Scott to, to bring us home on this uh, question of, you know, as you've gone through the projects and the successful projects that the utility has done, has what, it, what has been the experience with the regulator, you know, in terms of a partner, uh, having to jump through hoops, that kind of thing? Okay, so this project that we're talking about, the wastewater going on to Fort Bliss, that project's over 40 years old, and people talk to me and say, hey, you got an ASR permit. Well, actually, it's just a wastewater disposal permit. The state said, you can do this on the condition your wastewater is treated to meet potable standards, and that has been the uh, basis of our permit. Uh, they uh, have been approving our permit for the last 40 years, and it's it's... For the wastewater operators, it's a disposal, and for somebody like me, a water resources guy, this is a aqua recharge. And then I, I'd also like to add that the water, uh, the highly treated effluent is uh, used for the golf course and the electric company, so it is a story and beneficial reuse, uh, recognizing the value of, uh, of uh, effluent in the desert. Yeah, I wonder whether wastewater is starting to become a term that doesn't have a lot of meaning since it's really not waste. I mean, it's it's water that has potential for use more than, than wastewater. I'm too old to change my my diction on that one, but that is an interesting thought. And so I think we're at the time where we're going to move to just a set of closing questions for you. And, and Christy, I'm going to have you lead it out. Um, you're heavy into state water planning and wanted to get your perspective on how many of these strategies are appearing in this kind of current round we're in the middle of for, for regional planning. Sure, well, it's it's really exciting. I will say that um, part of the uh, 2017 state water plan, which was based on the 2016 regional water plans, there were 15 ASR projects that were listed or water management strategies that were recommended. Um, in the most recent round of planning, which uh, was included in the 2022 state water plan, there's 192 
ASR water management strategies across the state. Much of that had to do with the new provision um, that said if you've got an area that has a need that you need to consider aquifer storage and recovery, um, seawater desalination, and a few other innovative strategies first. So after you look at water conservation, take a look at these strategies. And so the planning groups had to do that. 10 of the 16 planning regions um, recommended ASR projects. Those that didn't, um, it was because of a myriad of situations. Maybe there wasn't a sponsor to walk up and say, we want to study this, um, or because they didn't feel like there was favorable hydrogeology. I think that that's going to change a little bit in this round of planning now that the um, Water Development Board statewide ASR tool is available for planning groups to be able to hone in and see where does the hydrogeology match with the needs, match with the water availability for these projects. And you can query that on the board's website um, for your particular region of interest. New up in, in part of the uh, 2026 planning process is that continuum in evaluating ASR, but then also there's a, a provision that was introduced during the last round of planning, but I think it's going to get even deeper this time. And that is that if you have a, a um, significant water need, that you would perform an ASR assessment to evaluate the feasibility of it. So it's taking it just even a deeper level and, and identifying also the recovery efficiency and just fully evaluating that. And so it's really exciting. I think that it's been... The, the legislative support um, and the, the technical community in really looking at how can ASR and MAR be used to help secure our water supplies in the future. And I know that where we are right now in San Antonio, like their ASR project is, is going really big right now. I, I think they're producing like 50 MGD. Um, and it's been a real drought-proof kind of aspect of of securing reliable water. Yeah, that is that is definitely an example of incredible success, just like Scott has had with, with El Paso. Um, I'm just gonna kind of kick it to David and Steve now, and I wanted to talk about momentum, which is kind of a vague term, but you know, are you seeing interest and forward thinking and momentum from public utilities and industry for implementing the types of strategies? I know you're kind of in piloting, Steve, on produced water, Maybe SR is a little further along, but what are you guys seeing? You want to start out, Steve, on that? Well, so I'm on the Produce Water Consortium, and, and the, the people that pay for that, to me to be there, is Texas section of AWWA, which is really represents the municipal type, you know, potable water suppliers. And, and that whole group, which includes me, are, are skeptical and, and always want to see the proof. And, and slowly but surely, we are starting to see some proof of that. There's already been desktop, uh, you know, small scale production in, in the, on the lab scale that has shown these technologies to work uh you know so we're you know we're, we're cautiously optimistic and actually you know it's i think the the momentum is building as a result of the seismic concern from these deep injection wells is that that momentum has pushed things further faster than i thought possible and uh, i think it's reasonably possible that we will see some project in like 2028 or something like that actually happen and and, you know, we could have, you know, 100 million gallons a day, for example, at a single site, you know, coming into a, a, a location. It could be an, it could be a managed aquifer recharge, just if, it, but what, you have to see this all day, every day, 24-7, 1,440 minutes a day we, that we can monitor it in a way. And that's the other improvements that will have to be made is we're, we're looking at for continuous monitoring that will track the deep dive analytics to prove up this, this, the safety of this water. So, anyway, I'm, I'm becoming cautiously optimistic that we can get there especially with the harvesting of other minerals that are going to help it pay for this and um so you know it, it's a it'll be interesting to watch this happen because we desperately need the water that region f really needs the water so you get down to actual local folks they they would like yeah well we could we'd love to store that and they've already got the pipelines that are already built to bring it water right to like pecos valley alluvium areas and uh edges of the ogallala are already available to be there it's just that the network exists. We have to prove up the treatment and prove up the monitoring, prove up the toxicity issues uh, and all that sort of thing. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited to be part of this thing. So you know, we're going to stay very diligent to watching this. Sounds like then there, there definitely is some momentum. It's still early days, but it sounds like a lot of, lot of momentum, a lot of encouraging things coming out of that program. And so, David, could you talk a little bit more? I think you even mentioned one, you know, in Hawaii where you're, it's kind of an alternative source and 
you know, you're finding a way to store the water anyway. So talk a little bit about that. Well, I didn't. Re I want to stay focused on Texas, but bottom line is there's no question momentum is building. But one thing to be aware of is ASR as a principle is a really simple concept. Unfortunately, there's technical things that we need to consider. And so typically we take on a phased program in terms of the desktop. So, you know, the tools that Christy and her team helped develop is like the first level of saying, well, should we even think about something in this location? And then you'll start doing a detailed feasibility, drilling, test wells, cycle testing to demonstrate what happens to the water quality. And I think that's where Texas is for a number of sites that are wanting to be implemented. We've either in the middle of our pilot studies or just finished our pilot studies. So now you're going to see actual implementation and momentum growing as we go to putting in full scale production wells and expanding well fields. Um, I mean, something that's holding back Williamson County right now was that legislative fix that we needed. There's going to be momentum just for solving some of that central Texas Austin area growth. But one of the things that's going on in that area is we're looking at recharging 3,200 feet down. People don't drill wells that deep every day. So there's a lack of geologic knowledge. So we are going to need to drill those test wells and get the information we need. I mean, we're already using all the tools. One of the things that Texas is blessed with is from oil and gas, there's a lot of seismic and geophysical log data. So we're using that as part of our toolkit with the seismic interpretations, figuring out the structure, the geology, the top and bottom layers. So at least we know where we need to drill to, but we've got to capture those you know, important data points. But what I think you'll find is in another one or two years time, there will be definitely a lot more growth and expansion. We're right at that cusp right now of embracing that technology. And I think the final quick thing I want to add is to say one more time, ASR, we're trying to find deep confining zones where the our stored water stays put. We're not there to put that water strategically just for it to migrate to a spring or to a neighbor and to be lost. We're trying to retain that water in that area. So we are as a generalization going into deeper systems. And, and I hope that, you know, all these water strategies that are in the, in the regional water plans, I mean, we're now required as planners to go do a back looking and see whether these plans that got, or the strategies that got promised, we got to reevaluate. And if they didn't actually get built, then we take them out of the plan. It's, it's a new thing that is a requirement. And so I'm very excited to see whether all those, those uh, innovative <coughs> strategies that are in the plan are actually in the early stages. And well, that'll all come out of the process this time. Um, Scott, I wanted you to finish the, the closing question segment and just talk about whether you all have any future plans for similar strategies or expansion of current strategies, those kinds of things. So I heard the word momentum mentioned, and I would like to say that with our 40 years of treating wastewater to meet potable standards, beneficially using it by powered plants or golf courses or putting it back into the aquifer, this is a segue. This is a we'll use our letters IPR, indirect potable reuse, beneficially using it. But then uh, it's the segue towards us going towards a DPR, direct potable reuse. Okay. And when we talk to the state about our DPR system, our purified water system, I think we have the confidence and, and the state knows that, you know, you can treat wastewater to meet potable standards and we've been doing it. It's nothing new. And so ultimately when we get our DPR system built, our purified water plant built in the next two or three years. Um, I think that's having 40 years track record of being able to do this, beneficially using what was considered a waste product as a resource product is a segue for us increasing our water supply. And I think it'll be interesting to see, you talked about state water planning, how many more uh, regions get into DPR. Yeah, the whole, have you started your Showers to Flowers campaign yet with the public? Uh, so speaking of the public, our public is a 84% approval rate on a purified water. Wow, So uh, cool. I think it's a testimony to being uh, open with your public, unlike Arizona, right? <laughs> so <laughs> that was from the other day. Yeah, but um, being open with your public and letting them know and when you need water and there's technology we want to talk about the the quality of the water not the history of the water and so i think we're ready and i think i think steve would agree with that let's talk about the quality of the water let's you know is produced water is wastewater there's technology to do something with that and use it absolutely and i really appreciate 
this time. I think we've kind of run into the audience questions a little bit already. So, Leah, do we have a couple of minutes for audience questions? Yeah, we can definitely do one or two. And I did have one come in on the app. But it, do we have anyone in the audience? All right. I'll, I'll do this one quick, and then we'll see where we are. Someone asked about whether or not um, ASR, let me make sure I get this right. Uh, can MAR, ASR, and AR be used for flood mitigation or during flood events, and how? So was the question whether you could be used to capture flood water? That's how I read it, yeah. Okay. I mean, there have been studies, and, and I, I shouldn't even, I'm the, I'm the moderator, I shouldn't be ahead, talking about ahead. this. No, no. <laughs> Did, <laughs> David, David, why don't you talk I'm a little bit yeah, so over to you? Yeah. Uh, uh, so I, I, the reason I, I'm asking is David is because he was in Florida for a long time. Florida actually does this type of capture mm -hmm. technology in some places. So, but talk about it in Texas if you can. So my quick answer is we need to harvest those flood flows. For ASR, we're limited by the rate at which we can get that flood water into the ground. And so several of us have evaluated, for example, in this Houston area, what could we do in the future? And the quick answer was we would need too many wells to get that water in the time frame we need. However, there are projects out there where we're considering putting bank side storage next to rivers where we divert the flood flow into that bank side storage, allow the sediment to drop out, and then over a longer period of time, get that water into the ground. And of course, we have reservoirs that are already doing that. That's why we're having conversations with the Corps of Engineers to say, don't release that flood water so quickly. You've got more of a buffer. We need time to get it into the ground. Christy, would you want to add to that? Yeah, I just want to add that that's a perfect um, opportunity for using the reservoir systems like you were talking about or even off-channel reservoirs. If you found like an area that topographically makes sense to where you can minimize your evaporative losses and you can create a pumping system to capture some of that flood pool water um, and store it for beneficial use at a later time, you can use that off-channel reservoir as kind of a filtering or a sedimentation basin of sorts. And then it purifies that water and gets it to the point that, that it would be more readily available um, for for ASR. I wanted to also mention that that, that Edwards fill that I was t talking a little bit about, or, or I guess water code, um, that that does have a provision that allows improving natural recharge features um, to inject stormwater, um, flood water, or groundwater to provide additional recharge. Um, so it would be interesting to see how that might be used in the future, but it does allow that exact thing. Um, it's just that, you know, if your purpose is to, to retrieve that water at a later time, you're going to have to chase it um, because it's not really entirely sure except through tracer tests where, where that water might end up. So not so much for an ASR application, but, you know, certainly for beneficial use of the aquifer, I think that could be exercised in the future. Makes sense. So we are a minute past now and going into our coffee time. So why don't we give this panel a round of applause? I know they'll be around during the break.